We're going to try something new, just out of curiosity. Do you hear my cat in the background? Yeah, I heard a little meow. There may be cat sounds in the background. Do not be alarmed. The thesis of the video is that mobile games are the same thing as most classroom practices, especially like uh, no excuses, charter school, really authoritarian classroom practices. Here's an example of what operant conditioning is which is a cornerstone element of B.F. Skinner, the father of radical behaviorism, came up with this idea. So we have a, a rat in a Skinner box, which is the name of this mm. mechanism here. And the rat is pulling a lever. You can see they're pulling a lever here. And every single time they pull a lever, they get some food. The idea, right, is to create this association between the action, the stimulus, and the reward. Um, and then you would um, do sort of an intermittent reward, right? So that way you wouldn't give it every single time to kind of help reinforce the pattern or the behavior, you know? It's testing both positive operant conditioning and negative operant right. conditioning. So in this machine, you have obviously a box. You have a spot where the food comes out when the lever's pulled, which is right here. You have a light that flickers on and off, which is meant to do almost like a, a Pavlovian style mechanism, like the flashing lights signal some kind of response as well. So there's a visual connection. And there's also mm -hmm. a loudspeaker in here, which also sends like a beep signal when the light goes off, but also can be used to monitor the sounds the, the animal is making. Anyways, the test positive operant conditioning, the rat just pulls in the lever and they get rewarded. But the variation is the entire base of this thing is also filled with electrical current and they'll basically zap the rat, teaching it to pull the lever if it's getting zapped. So it mm. rushes to pull the lever if it's getting zapped as well. There's reward seeking behavior, and but then there's also consequence avoiding behavior. You want to avoid the bad and seek the good. The whole idea was to condition someone so that they would do the right thing without even thinking about it. It would actually, it's called operant conditioning. Here's a chart of it right here. You can see there's reinforcement and punishment. Reinforcement increases behavior. Punishment decreases behavior. So when you're reinforced towards positive behavior, you get some kind of appetitive stimulus. Um, sure. <laughs> I think is how you pronounce that, like to fuel your appetite. And so an, an appetitive stimulus, AKA like a gold star, positive praise, sure. higher grade, et Great. cetera or you reinforce negative things. So you're increasing behavior by removing the noxious stimuli. So maybe mm. you're facing pressure or someone's like looking over your shoulder. If you do the right thing, they'll, they'll walk away. And then if you're punishing someone, you're again, either removing that, that negative thing or you're punishing them. Like you're sending an electric shock towards them. This isn't necessarily related to behaviorism. It's just one of the things that stands out, which I think gives a good idea of his personality and who he is. B.S. Skinner invented this uh, box for children, which he put his own child in. Worth noting, his kid says that he was a great dad and that this didn't like affect her in any way, but it doesn't make it any less weird. It's a soundproof. Yeah, yeah. It's like this soundproof sterile box. You could see an image of it here with perfect temperature and humidity. And they would basically leave their kid in here. So the idea is that they wouldn't interact with their child. They would just leave them in there if they were crying or something, and eventually they would get over it inside this sterile box. B.F. Skinner wrote a science fiction novel called Walden 2. Weird. It's a reference to Walden Lake, um, a Thoreau, yeah. right? And it's really bizarre because most utopia novels are critiques of utopias to demonstrate that, that, that they're dystopias. Mm -hmm. Skinner did not believe people had free will. Skinner believed right. that we were going through operant conditioning since birth and we were most at ease when we were doing the exact, exact thing that we were reinforced to right. do. So in Walden 2, the plot is, is that these people learn about this place, Walden, that is led by what is a benevolent dictator, a, a single person who, who runs this area, yep. who for all intents and purposes is BF Skinner is this dictator. <laughs> and they're showcasing the city of Walden and how happy everyone is to be doing the exact thing that they were trained to do since birth using behaviorism. Mm. So there's, there's miners and farmers and teachers 
And that's just what they do because that's the conditioning that they had. And then they go to bed and they wake up and they do that every single day. And everyone has their place and everyone's super happy and no one questions Very anything. brave new world. And that's the entire yeah. book. The, the idea is that, okay, we're born a tabula rasa, blank slate, and our actions and our behaviors are the result of the accumulated um, rewards and punishments and the interaction between the environment over the course of our lifetime. Which is really where we get to the, the mobile game connection. Yes, finally. Behaviorism is a very easy way to design how our kind of like monkey brain senses work, where we can easily trick people into doing very repetitious tasks because we want to see the gold star at the end, as opposed to actually deeply engaging with content in a meaningful way. We have Manor Matters, which is like a puzzle game. And then we have Singing Monsters, which I'll say for the end. Singing Monsters is a game that's aimed at kids. Oh, so really? Th- let's start with Watcher of I thought it was aimed at PhD and students. Just, <laughs> I've never played this. I, I, I have no idea what to expect. Okay, we got to choose our character. I mean, obviously we choose the first character, right? Oh, you can't play the other ones. Unless you want this guy. Oh, it's a day seven gift. I can't pick this character. No, yeah, yeah, okay. Voltus. Summon. Watch this game is like awesome. <laughs> Okay, so we're putting them down. Oh, we're putting down down the thing. Oh, is it a tower defense game? Oh. So like they're gonna come oh. in. Aha. Oh. All right, I like tower That's defense games. Right, this this could be fun. Switch. I totally thought it was gonna be like a uh, dungeon crawler. All right. Okay. Oh. oh. Hey. Taking a second here, this is an element of practically every mobile game, which is the gotcha system. The element that most of these games play around is you want to get better cards because it makes you more powerful, but grinding for the more powerful card is going to take you a lot of time. Anyone who's played a game in the last, especially like five to 10 years, knows about the gotcha system. It's in everything, even now in like more mainstream games, not even just mobile right. games. So games like Genshin uh, Impact right. and some of those other more popular. I've seen a lot of mobile right. or, or uh, advertisements for them, even though I've, I don't think I've usually played them. All right. And then here's another element of, again, behaviorist thought, like shiny things, encouraging repetitious behavior. So because we did this for the first time, we get these gems. And then we also, if we three star it, get even more gems and coins. I'm going to predict that it is going to cost currency to replay the level which means that the operant conditioning is doing the exact same thing over and over again to get those coins. Also, it's funny, I, I can't actually click on anything. I have to click complete here. Um, I'm just gonna keep guiding me through this game. Okay, unleash Rex, okay. Click click here, okay. Do you, do you think you have a lot of autonomy as a player right now? Are you exercising a lot of agency? Um, what's gonna happen, the, I mean, the element of all these games, right, is after about an hour or two in, you get to that roadblock that is impossible to do without grinding just a ton or buying and purchasing for like five or $10, those micro purchases. Because we've been conditioned just like Skinner's rats that pulling the lever is fun. Like the actual, like pulling the card out, might you might get a good card, that'd be super fun. Um, most of these games, uh, will feature some kind of like tipping the tables where where you unlock your first card pack, Mm -hmm. you get something super rare. So every single time I see one of these like pretty victory screens and all like the crystals and these leveling bars, like all of these are just like a slot machine. Yes, well, and and just like those, the reason slot machines are built like that is because then you become conditioned by the sound. Like that gets a dopamine release when you hear the sound, when you see the thing, you feel like you've accomplished something. So I'm gonna close out of this one. Okay. You get the idea, right? It's the same concept as as this, right? So in operant conditioning, imagine that the rat is me playing this really boring tower defense game, right? Right now I'm getting positive operant conditioning Uh, as you start with any form of behaviorism, right? So positive operant conditioning, I'm seeing the fun light, which is associating with food, AKA like I'm opening up my card pack. Uh, I'm getting cool things. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a lot of three stars. I feel good. But then, you know, as we're getting towards the end here, well, this light isn't walking up anymore. Now the, uh, this one down here is negative, negative light. 
now it's like, well, shit, I want to keep playing. I had so much fun with the the glowy lights right. and the opening trading card packs. Now I need to spend five dollars, and you're and invested. I spend Ten dollars, right? You're invested just, in the characters. Yep, and get a little more of that dopamine. Yes, you're invested yep. in the in the gameplay. Like, well, I've already played for an hour. I might as well just put two dollars in here. And um, yeah, there's a reason why these pay to pay to play systems rake in more money than if you just paid five dollars up front just to unlock the full game or something. So this came out in 2020. It's revenue in the last 30 days. Oh. Okay. Is over two million dollars. Lifetime is over ten million dollars. Oh, it must have been like early access or something. Or you can get three thousand diamonds, which gives you an extra one thousand for ninety-two ninety-nine. Ninety-two British. Yeah, AKA pounds. about a hundred dollars right. USD. And it costs roughly five-ish dollars to do a pull. So five dollars a pull. Zero point something chance to get a legendary. You're looking at easily a hundred dollars to get a decent card. And again, I would bet that they 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 wait the pulls so that you get a legendary card early on, so you feel like you have a higher chance of getting them. It's no different again than our rat friend here, uh, who's going through operating conditioning. This is called Tina and Sylvester wrote that book called Designing Games. He calls this a virtual Skinner box. Because despite how scummy this is and the fact that we haven't been talking about an actual video game here for the last five, 10 minutes, it works. This because this is how people can learn in a very rote way well, and to do it's something. also how these systems can be exploitative. Let's just imagine that instead of just being food and treats for these mice, it's sugar or it's caffeine or it's, you know, something that's addicting. Right. We know the, how gambling can be habit forming and addicting. Right. So it can. You know, people struggle from gambling addiction. People struggle from drug addiction because of the chemical, psychological, um, physical changes to the structure of the brain that result uh, as a function of that behavioral, that, that behaviorist conditioning. Right. And it's no different than in, in school, right? Whenever you do something good, we will eventually have a video on PBIS, positive behavior incentive systems, which are required in most school mm -hmm. districts across the country, which give you positive rewards either for doing typically non-academic things, but sometimes getting good grades as well. Right. So like you open up the door for someone, you're a good kid that day. So go pick a prize out of the prize box and get a sticker or a balloon or, you know, whatever it might be. It's, it's more insidious because in a lot of them, you actually earn a currency. So you do an action, you earn a currency yeah. You know, it's a it's a store buck or it's a, a car and you can redeem them or enter them for you can enter them for drawings or something like that. Or you earn enough of these like PBIS dollars and then you can redeem them for certain prizes. Like at the end of the week, the store opens up and you can spend 10 to get this, that or the other thing. And same thing here with something like this, like behavior charts, mm. um, which are still a thing. Class Dojo claims to be in 95 percent of school districts what um, That's crazy. class dojo which is the, the digital version of this system where you have a behavior chart where it publicly displays people moving up a board for good behavior or down for bad behavior there's your negative operant conditioner so if i'm gregory on here right i'm going to be feeling bad because rachel's been doing well every single time this is a form of public shame Right. To encourage me to do better because I'm not being rewarded in the exact same way that I bet if Rachel doesn't get good behavior there on day seven and first quarter, she's going to be freaking out because she is now uh, addicted to that feeling of praise. Mm. Um, it's it's more about the praise and it's it, the, the issue with PBIS and academic behaviorism is that it becomes more about the incentive than it does the act of doing right. it. The other thing we know about rewards is that there's diminishing returns. So that first sticker hit might be like, oh, yeah, dude, sticker. The second one, you're like, OK. And the third one, you know, it just kind of becomes the, the norm until you take it away or you don't deliver it. And then it's a shock. Right. It's like, OK, why didn't I get the sticker? Right. Right. I've been getting these stickers. I don't understand why. So here's the thing about the reward system for kids who aren't getting them. They don't matter. <laughs> Because they're not bought into the system yeah. anyway. So it's like, okay, give me a sticker or not. I'm used to not getting them. For the kids who get them, not getting them then becomes a source of stress. And they need more and more and more of them because the tolerance to any kind of thing. Again, this is how cycles of addiction, you know, gambling, caffeine, 
that your tolerance builds up as you do- get less of a dopamine hit. So let's dive in now to Manor Matters. This was in the top 10 in puzzle games. Um, Hello. Yeah. Oh, this is like the game from the ads. Hilarious. Oh, it's telling Wait. you what one to do. You have to pull that one, Chris. Yes. It's telling you what one to do. Pull it. All right. I'm trying to pull it. Do I pull down? Can you do a different one? There you go. Oh. Wow, I'm I'm well done. Oh, you crushed that one, Chris. Beat levels, earn stars, complete tasks. Let's go. <laughs> it's so funny. There's not even that's not even a game. There's no gameplay. That's not a game. That it literally is just the reward system. Is this not just school? Is this not how school? Because the, I mean, the argument dun. is not. <laughs> the argument is that school is rude in behaviorism. I wrote a whole article on this about how school has really fundamentally not moved away from this concept, which is complete assignments, right? Yep. Or complete tests, whatever. Beat them, get high yep. grades uh, to earn high grades, which are your stars. Which is like the currency and that of school, and then more tasks do that over and over again, and and then learn things. So then, tra- again, transitioning back to the school model, um, I pulled in these screenshots from walkthroughs with a U, which is the UK version of uh, of Teach Like a Champion. These are exceptionally so Teach Like a Champion guides and books. They are extremely popular. Teach Like a Champion is a series of behaviorist methods. We have a whole video on Doug LaMov and Teach Like a Champion and how it impacts schools. Walkthroughs are a visual guidebook of very similar concepts that are popularized in the UK based around the same principles. Mm. So I pulled out three of these just to demonstrate what is behaviorism and how people are using it. Right. This is not revolutionary. (laughs) Cold calling. What? Okay. Cold calling is an example of behaviorism. Okay, you again, it's look at how simplistic the tasks are and how they relate to that image that we just showed from manner yeah. matters. You ask the class a question, you give thinking time, you select someone at random, they respond, and then you select another student. Oh, I'm so glad that there's again. a five step process for cold calling. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to understand it. Exactly. But it's a repetitious form of operant conditioning, and that's intentional. It's not like they're leaning away from this or they would argue that it's not operant conditioning. They believe in operant conditioning. This is a form of either positive or negative operant conditioning in the sense that it's positive. If you get the answer right, good job, that's great. Thanks for doing that. Negative operant conditioning, because if you get it wrong, now all of your friends are going to laugh at you. The negative impact is that they, as you know, only focus on getting the answer right and aren't listening or engaging with anyone else around them. It's a form of fear and usually you don't learn very well when you're fearful or anxious um, in any situation. You just are in fight or flight. If you do these things, you'll get some kind of input and output, or it's something that teachers can more readily control. Like in this, you know, signal, pause, insist, choose a signal. So my own children, right, in their kind of class experience, they'll have like a signal where they'll say like, one, two, three, eyes on me. And the response is one, two, eyes on you. And those things can be fine, right? You got to have a way to get kids attention. You got to do all this. Um, But again, this isn't like groundbreaking, nor should it be the like entire scope of your pedagogy. There should be more to it than just like this kind of signaling. So again, it's not rocket science and it's not like there's anything wrong with any of these things in isolation, but just keep in mind, this is where teaching begins and ends in behaviorism. As Nick just said, this is what the class is all day, every day is you sit, you have a lecture, people go through cold calling and checks for understanding. You might do a turn and talk in there. That's school. You go through that every single day. None of this should be shocking to anyone because I'm going to bet that if you went through a typical K-12 education, this is the majority of your classes because this is how people historically are taught to teach is through behaviorist methods, um, which we also find in mobile games. Let's do one more. Okay, so this is My Singing Monsters Dawn of Fire, which is an aim, a game aimed at E for Everyone. It's for kids. Select your Do they eight. have? <laughs> it started 48. at 48. Just be 48. Just be 48 for the uh, sake of this. No, I want to be... <gasps> how low can I'm it go? five years How low old. can it go? Oh, click on accept. One year old. Let's see if it'll accept it if it's too low. <gasps> it'll let you play if you're five. Old, five. I feel like it shouldn't let you play if you're five, honestly. Five. Maybe this one's good. 
I don't have high hopes. We can use this breeding structure <laughs> to create new monsters and, <laughs> and build our song. Let's tap the breeding okay, structure. Click here. Rubble. Drag a noggin into the breeding oh. structure. Uh, Mom, let's breed. Oh, what's I breeding? Well, it takes two. You got to put two in there. You got to have a noggin and a cana. Yeah. Let's use diamonds to speed it up. All right. Well, you got to tap the breeding structure. Oh, speed it up. Or you can watch an ad. Our new monster egg is ready. Our new monster egg. Oh. Wow, it even has me use the premium currency in the first 30 seconds of the tutorial. Right. You've hatched Oh, stog. I got stog. This is the monster section of the markets. These are coins, so this is a it. different currency. He's cranked too. Look at that. It, Look at that little mammoth. He needs treats to level up so we can breed new monsters. Let's get a fruit tree. So this is a time locked game, very clearly. You're gonna you're gonna hit the cap on that diamond currency, and you're gonna have to spend that to uh, progress through the game, right? Can I just say too how frustrating these kinds of games are? As somebody who grew up playing Theme Park, Theme Hospital, Sim City sim uh the sims you know any kind of those those kinds of games where you just like were given this blank canvas and there weren't a lot of tutorials from what i can recall and you just had to kind of figure it out but you had a lot of agency in what that looked like and you learned by trial and error yeah you learned through immersion as any good game yes. would be this is just telling you exactly what to do which is the same thing as like doing worksheets there's not a lot of real thought you're just going through each step right, and choice and going being guided through every single question as opposed to just learning by doing or choice so this part's telling me it's a free-to-play game but i can buy in-app purchase because there's these giant things that say sale on the upper oh, okay. right so i clicked the first thing i saw it says please ask a trusted adult before you buy any currency and, pack. and remember remember that chris input his age as five years old when, when you were logging into this game so the game thinks that you're five. And I could just buy it right now. Wow. Like I look, it popped up. The game, if we just look at the screen presence here, the behaviorist elements, there's a giant level up bar, coins and diamonds, which are both these are all three of these rewards. Giant sale icons, my little lights. Bottom right, there's this giant like number here for the market, which is where I buy things, which also would encourage me to, you know, even when I hit wait. Even when I hit the market in the bottom left, get like a coins, get eighth diamonds. Of the screen is get coins and get diamonds. Well, let's level up your guys here real more quick. Let's see what the that. gameplay is like. Because I think the okay. big takeaway so here apples. is that there is no real gameplay. The gameplay is just the reward structure itself, right? That's really what we are criticizing when we're criticizing gamification, be it a part of this or in education itself, is that gamification means that you're the reward for the learning is the uh, or I guess the game itself is the reward and that's like a it's like a weird way of thinking about I don't even know what's happening on the screen I'm spending my diamonds to feed lava Lee you don't run out of diamonds Chris it's fine it's fine I'm in control right now you want to feed the, uh, you want to feed Lava Lee with me? <laughs> Dude, Chris, you're going to run out of diamonds. I'm living on the edge. What are you going to do when you run out of diamonds? Uh-oh. Do you want to buy more? Can I spend $2 on that? Hey! Party Island. There you go. Yeah. Oh, oh there you go. So party it for some reason. Okay. Oh, I gotta wait. I don't want to wait. Wait four minutes. Speed up. Use diamonds. Use diamonds. Oh, great animation. Oh. Oh, only for only three dollars, I could get thirty thousand coins. Okay. I. That doesn't even ask me anymore if I'm an adult. I just wonder. I wonder. Oh, wait, I can go to those islands. I wonder. Okay, hear me out here. If you had kids who were playing this game and you asked them, what's the point of this game? 
are they going to refer at all to the story, what they're supposed to be doing, or are they going to refer to the reward system, right, as the game itself? So if, if, if my five-year-old was playing this and I was like, oh, what's this game about, bud? He'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm having to raise these monsters so that I can get more diamonds and I can get more coins and then I can get more monsters. I've even heard the same thing from like my daughter. Their summer kids club program uses class dojo and they get dojo points and they were doing an egg drop and there were dojo points attached to the success of their egg drop. So it wasn't about figuring out, hey, how can we, you know, safely drop this egg without leaving the egg broken? The thing that she told me about it was she was like, oh, our egg broke. And so we didn't get any dojo points. That was her takeaway from this activity. I'm not, oh my God. Saw this, this is the top gamer, MS, MSM Pokey Gamer is the number one on the leaderboard, which is another form of behaviorism, FYI, like force of competitiveness through showcasing how you're doing. Um, this is peak gameplay. This is the number one rated player. Yeah, my singing monsters in the last 30 days, according to this website, has generated $2 million. Probably because you could set that your age is five years old and then just instantly. Oh, yeah. But anyways, I did want to showcase. It's kind of a low resolution graphic, okay. but this is from Class Dojo. If you have kids, you probably have seen yep. this. This idea of you have positive points and negative right. points for doing certain things. In this image, you could see like you get positive points maybe for helping others, participating, persistence. You have 91% positive. Or maybe if like distracting class, you get a negative thing. Class Dojo also has like, I mean, let's just watch really quick. You know, here's your class at a glance. In this case, they all have positive points, which is good. Your whole class also is incentivized to have positive points. But you, you know, you select the kid and then you have all these things. But then good job, Alice, for having a go. There's your little, your little rat right. light. And then uh -oh. needs work. Talking about a turn. Parents probably also have access to class. Do I mean, you have a dojo app on your phone, so you can track either in real time or however. Right. And, and perhaps even older students may even have a version of that on their phone, too. So they're often getting that feedback in real time. And, you know, there, there's a lot of equivalencies between these and online LMS and online grade books, because you might be in social studies class, but you're getting input the test results from the Spanish class that you just left. And so you're in social studies class, like, right, you're, you're hanging out, you're having a good time. And, um, and then all of a sudden you get a phone notification and you go, oh, let me check my phone. And it's, you got a D minus on your Spanish exam because blah, 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 blah. And now you're like, okay, great. Like that has an impact on your mood, on your demeanor in the next class, because all you can think about is now the poor grade that you got. What we're saying is that these mobile practices that no one likes are addictive and they work, which is exactly why they're working and being used in schools. Because even though this sucks and has a really negative impact on our psyche and in a game's case, our wallet, people use it because functionally it can work. But as we led with, it has very precarious side effects for people's development, who they are, their purpose in life, like becoming a more actualized, happy human being, because we're not, I mean, I, I would even argue this is, you know, inhumane to rats, um, let alone to people. Uh, interestingly enough, I'll link, I'll link the, the study in here, but in one of our older articles, we, we had talked about how animal trainers are starting to move away from behaviorism uh, because it's seen to be cruelty to animals. Again, to summarize here at the very end, what could you do instead? Here's a list from one of uh, the articles that I had recently written of behaviorist, again, often problematic practices that are commonplace in pretty much every school. As we said earlier, these are fine in isolation. At least some of them are fine in isolation at times, but typically you, you probably want to stay away from these things. This includes concepts like cold calling, forcing eye contact, I like also known as slant and teach like a champion schools, uh, drill and kill, short repetitive things everyone writes do nows behavior charts hand signals no warnings class dojo points bell to bell teaching it's all about this like hyper controlled rote memorized quick release positive and negative reinforcement which as we saw in those games 
click here, click here. They're all like micro doses. You get your flashy little points at the end or you have to spend in order to get that release again. Mm-hmm. It's, it's intentionally designed that way because if you study this in the lab, people do engage more with like their brain receptors to these stimuli. The problem is that like what happens as a result of doing this over and over again? Well, what do you do instead? What's humanistic? What's progressive? What's a more positive way of thinking about teaching and learning? And note that they're much more nuanced and interpretive because we don't learn through scripts. It's things like self-expression, social emotional health, co-creation, open dialogue, active listening, uh, open-ended critical thinking, democratic dialogue. It's like getting your hands dirty and going out in the community and talking with people and, and doing something that matters to you which in a class is going to look like people maybe working by themselves or in groups, working on some kind of project over multiple periods, where there are times where I might give a lecture, there are times where there might be a worksheet where we review some stuff. But the primary purpose of the class is to do meaningful learning, not just do the exact same thing over and over again like this. In future episodes, I do want to dive into what does that look like in video games because there's an interesting over overlap there because most games that let you do that, most games that let you do meaningful things within the game and give you choice and voice, et cetera, are also the games that win all the awards. Right. Good game design is also good classroom design. Mic drop. Mic drop.